So it's my uh, great pleasure to open the Winter School with a lecture on ultra-fast laser sources. My name is Rocío Borrego and I'm within the Institute of Photonics at the Italian Research Council. And first, uh, let me give you an outline of what we are talking about during the next hour. So I will first review some basic properties of light passes and this will be useful for those of you who have a more chemistry background those of you who are working on uh, laser development or at the second laser sources, you might be familiar with this. But in any case, this will be useful to follow the rest of the talk and the upcoming talks in the morning. Then I will concentrate on the ultra fast laser technologies in the turnkey systems. So these are the commercial systems, those that you have available in your labs nowadays. And I will mainly talk about moth locking and the tube pass amplification technique. The second part of the talk will be uh, focused on the nonlinear optical techniques because we will see that these commercial lasers are limited in terms of uh, wavelengths and temporal duration, and we need nonlinear optics to access the different spectral range. So I will mainly concentrate on the optical parametric amplifier, the OPAs, and the holo fiber technique. And to end up with the talk and introduce the next speakers, I will give you a brief offline of the current research topics on ultra-fast laser sources nowadays. So in particular, a brief introduction to solid dynamics and light wave synthesizers. Okay, so let's start. And the, you know that the autochem section is focused on the electron dynamics uh, with photosecond passes. So let me first review the time scales of our molecules. And we can find processes that are ranging from the microsecond time scales, such as protein folder. If we go to shorter time scales in the picosecond domain, we find proton and electron transfer. And if we go even to shorter time scale, we can find internal conversion, which typically takes place from tens of femtosecond to picosecond or uh, pure electron dynamics, uh, which are in the other second time scale to a few femtosecond. So I hope uh, most of you are interested in the very first dynamics in a molecule. So there's those ranging from few hundreds of other second to few femtosecond. And you probably know why this is important. And this is because um, these dynamics are responsible for the response on longer time scales and the final chemical change. So for example, uh, pure electron dynamics determine how the nuclear electron arrange on later times. And this is why this is important. But of course, if I want to observe something that is happening in the fetosecond and even in the ad second regime, I need very short ultra, uh, ultra short light parses to observe them. So uh, now comes the answer, how short is a pass? For this, we have the Big Bang Theory. And just let me show you this episode, which will answer our question. Okay, this 130 at the second was an old record because this is an old episode. So this is a paper from 2006. But uh, actually the current record, if I remember properly, is around 45 at a second. It was uh, in 2017, I think. So um, the next question that can come into our mind is, uh, how do we achieve to search uh, short pulses? And for this, we have to review, no, for this, we have to review the optical techniques that have been developed in during time and which are the breakthroughs associated with that. Okay, so first we have Q switching, which is a technique that typically gives um, passes in the nanosecond domain. So this is widely used for pump lasers, for example. If we move in time, we find moth locking. And moth locking allowed for pulses as short as 10 femtoseconds. The problem is that the, uh, with the mode locking technique, we can achieve very high repetition rate with very short pulses, but the pulse per energy is low. And this was resolved by the CPA technologies in 1985. 
So this uh, allowed to have very short pulses, but also with a lot of energy per pulse. This opened the way to a kind of new experiments. So for example, when combined with the holocaust fiber, it allowed for the generation of the 130 at the second pulses that Penny and Sheldon were talking about in the previous theory. So we were here. And then within the recent years, this has been extended even uh, to shorter wavelengths to the Sophix region. Okay, so uh, in this talk, it will be mainly focused on moth locking, CPA, holoco fiber, and also on OPA amplifiers, even if they are not mentioned here. So as I said at the beginning, I will now review a basic concept related to life passes that will allow us to follow the rest of the winter school. So the first thing is, what is a light pass? So basically, a light pass can be described as an envelope and a carrier. And in the simple case that I can separate the spatial and the temporal dependence of the electric field, I can create the electric field as an envelope which is light by a phase. So as you see in this term of the phase, they have the carrier frequency and the carrier envelope phase. I will come back later to this concept. So let's now talk about the carrier frequency. And this is important because actually this is limiting the uh, minimum temporal duration that I can give with the pass, which is uh, given by the optical cycle. So if I go to the electromagnetic spectrum, I see, for example, that in the visible, the optical cycle is two frames a second. So this is the minimum duration that I can get with the pulse in the visible. If I want to have photosecond pulses, I need to go to the XUV or suffix ray regime to shorter wavelengths. But the, the wavelength does not only determine the optical cycle and the minimum temporal duration, it also determines the kind of uh, molecular process that I can observe. So uh, let's have a look here. So from the physical point of view, if I am pumping in the infrared, I mainly access molecular vibrations. If I'm going to be civil to the vacuum UV, then I can access balanced electronic excitations. And if I go deeper, so for example, to the suffix ray, I can observe core electron transitions. So this is, for example, if I want to study something with site specific elements and um, chemical reactions. But, uh, within the same family, so for example, within the balanced electronic excitations, I can also say that there are some differences. So for example, carotenoids, we are molecules that are involved in the photosynthesis, they absorb at uh, 530, while DNA bases absorb at around 270 nanometers in the UV. So this is telling me if, if I want to study the molecular dynamics of a carotenoid, I need a pass in the visible, if I want to study the uh, dynamics of our DNA and if it passes in the UV and so on and so forth. So the next questions that can come to our mind is how can I generate uh, such tunable pulses? So for this, let me review the optical sources that we have nowadays and which spectral regime they can access. Okay, so solid state laser, which are mainly commercial lasers, typically work in the near infrared. If I want to access the mid IR, I need to rely on OPAs or OPCPAs, and this will be the talk by Daniele Vrida and Nicola Tirey later this morning. Uh, also, with OPA, I can access the visible range. If I want to go to shorter wavelengths, so to UV, to the vacuum UV, I need to rely on nonlinear processes, so namely some frequency, second harmonic, third harmonic, or dispersive wave emission. And this will, this will be detailed by John Travers later uh, this morning. And if I want to go to the XUB or sub X ray, uh, we can do it by free electron lasers or high harmonic generations. This will be the talks in the uh, upcoming days. Okay, so um, up to now, we have talked about passes in the temporal domain. So, which is the shortest time uh, duration that I can. But it's very useful to have a look at the light passes on the frequency domain. And for that, we just need to do a Fourier transfer from one to the other. Um, what we see here is that the pass in the frequency domain is described by a spectral amplitude and a spectral phase. And as you know, by the Fourier transfer, a broad bandwidth in the frequency domain corresponds to a very short pass in the temporal domain. 
and also the other way around. So a narrow bandwidth in the frequency domain corresponds to a long, band, a long pulse in the frequency domain. So uh, for having a short pulse, I need a large bandwidth. But this is not the only requisite. So this is the first requisite, but not the only one. The second one is the phase. So we need to have a control on the spectral phase because actually it encodes the information of the pulse. So with a large bandwidth, I will have a broad spectrum. So I'm acting on this term, but I need this term to be flat. So why this term is typically not flat? So let's take the expression of the phase uh, of a wave in a dispersive medium. So as we know from basic optics courses, this can be created by the wave vector multiplied by the, uh, by the length. And the wave vector depends on the refractive index, which is dependent on the wavelength. Okay, so now I can do a Taylor expansion of the wave vector. This can be described as the wave vector of the carrier frequency plus uh, higher order terms. And let's have a, a look at the physical meaning of these terms. So the first derivative is the inverse of the group velocity. So this is the speed of the envelope of the pass. Then the second term is the group velocity dispersion. And basically, uh, this term is telling me that if I have a short pass and I'm coming into an optical medium with positive GVD, sometimes you will see that this uh, called V2, that is the same as GVD. Um, the fact is that the, since the refractive index depends on the wavelength, the red color will travel faster than the blue one. So I will get uh, the output, a pass that is broadening in time, with the weather frequency traveling on the front pass, the blue frequency is traveling on the rear part of the pass. So to better understand that this, we can have a look at this picture here. So uh, the first column is the spectral intensity and phase. The spectral intensity is the black line, the spectrum. And as you can see, in the three of them, we have the same spectrum. But the spectral phase is changing. So we have a flat spectral phase, a quadratic spectral phase, and a third order spectral phase. Okay, in the second column, we have the Fourier transfer of this. So we have the pulse in the temporal domain. And for example, in the first case, where the, far, where the phase is completely flat, I have the shortest duration that I can have. So um, a very useful way to have a look at this and at the meaning of the spectral phase is to have a look at the Bigner function. So in a Bigner diagram, we plot the frequency versus uh, time. So for example, here, this is telling me that when the, flat, uh, when the phase is flat, all the frequency components are arriving at the same time. If I now have a group delay dispersion, this was the second order on the equation that we saw before. So I have a quadratic spectral phase. You see that the effect on the temporal domain is a broadening of the pulse. And in the Bigner function, this phase corresponds to a line that is telling me that um, lower frequencies are coming first in time Higher frequencies, the blue ones that we said before, are coming later on time. And things are getting more complicated if I'm going, for example, to the third order dispersion. Because here, for example, if I take a line uh, within, uh, within this axis, so a fixed uh, time, I have more than one color arriving at the same time. So for example, I have a, a high and a, a low frequency at a given time. So which is the effect of the temporal order dispersion on the, um, on the temporal domain? So as you can see here, uh, the effect is having a pre or a post pass. And this is something that you want absolutely to avoid if you are doing a pump prep experiment, because this is giving you an artifact on your measurement. Uh, so you may think that uh, Bigner functions are something exotic or new, but actually they are not, because uh, you have a very good example in your everyday life which are the, which is the musical score. Okay, so uh, if you have a look at the musical score, here this is time, while the y-axis is frequency. And to play a song, I don't need only to know the notes, this is the frequency, but I also need to know how they are ordered in time, and that's the phase. 
So while I was preparing this talk, I was wondering what could be the sound of this uh, spectral faces and these light pulses. And I, I'm really sorry for those of you who are musicians, because I guess this is uh, terrible. And you will be listening not only to the sound of light, but also to my first test with a piano. And I guess it's terrible, but I hope it renders the idea. So uh, let's see if I do a transfer limit pass with a piano. Okay, so as you see, this corresponds to touching all the keys at the same time in the piano. So I get something that is, has a lot of frequencies, but it's short in time. Okay, so let's now have a look at the group velocity dispersion. Oh, let's skip. Sorry for that. And you see that within time, I'm going to higher frequencies. What happens now if I'm looking at the third order the dispersion? So the equivalent in the piano will be playing a high frequency and a low frequency notes uh, simultaneously. Okay, uh, let's continue. Um, so from a practical point of view, when do I have to care about dispersion on a medium? Okay, so the first thing we notice, this is, for example, the GVD for the few silica, is that it increases a lot with the frequency, with the, um, with the decreasing wavelength. So it means that the propagation of a 10 to second pulse will be much broader in time if it's uh, propagating in a few silica medium uh, at a central wavelength of 200 nanometers or 300 nanometers than if I'm going to the infrared. So typically, the dispersion effects are stronger in the UV than in the, in the IR. Okay. Um, in this plot, instead, you can see the output pulse versus the input pulse uh, for a pulse propagating in a two centimeters of BK glass. So what I see here, if, if I come in with a 150 femtosecond pulse, and it propagates through these two centimeters of uh, glass. At the output, I get almost the same temporal duration, 150. What happens now if I am dealing with a 50 femtosecond pulse? So I'm coming in with a 50 femtosecond pulse, and at the output, I get 75 femtosecond pulses. And this effect is even worse if I'm going, for example, to 25 femtoseconds. So 25 femtoseconds in the input, at the output, I get something like more than four, uh, more than 100 femtosecond. So we may say that the uh, effect of dispersion is dramatic if the pass width is shorter than 20 femtoseconds. And this is simply because the shorter the pass is, the more frequency components that, it's, uh, that it has, and then the more it will be stretching time. And um, when I wrote for the temporal dependence of the electric field, I also mentioned this carrying envelope phase. So let's see what it is. Okay, so um, imagine that I have a sequence of passes, and basically the carrier envelope phase is the offset between the carrier and the envelope. So here the carrier is the red line, so the electric field, and the envelope is the blue line. And as you can see from uh, one pass to the other, there is a phase shift between the red line and the blue line. Why is this happening? So uh, we can think of a, of a laser like an amplifying medium inside a cavity. And the fact is that the group velocity, so this is the uh, speed of the envelope and the phase velocity, this is the speed of the carrier, are different within the cavity. So as a result, what I have is that a uh, pulse is emitted by an oscillator half a fluctuation uh, in the carrier envelope phase. So when do I have to care about the carrier envelope phase? It depends. So if you are um, dealing with relatively long pulses, so 100 femtosecond pulses, or experiments that depend on the envelope, not in the shape of the electric field, this can be, for example, a classical pump proof experiment, uh, transient absorption in the visible with uh, 20 femtosecond passes even. Um, this is fine because this is the best, depends on the envelope. So I don't care about the career envelope phase. 
I have to care about the carrier envelope phase when I have something that depends on the shape of the liquid field. And this is, for example, the case of single atom second pulses. So if I want to generate single atom second pulses, I need the electric field to be exactly the same from one pulse to the other. So I need to stabilize this carrier envelope phase in such a way that this um, is not changing from pulse to pulse. I will not go into the details on how to measure and stabilize the carrier envelope phase. If you have uh, any questions about this, we can discuss at the end of the talk or during the coffee break. But uh, for the moment, it's not uh, strictly necessary to follow the, the rest of the talk. Okay, so now we have to talk about the basic concept of OLED pulses. We can go into the ultra fast laser technology. So um, we'll talk about the, the technologies that are used in the commercial systems. Okay, so the first thing uh, we have to uh, know is how can I achieve a very short pulse? Okay, so imagine that I have a frequency and I start adding two other frequencies, slightly ship with respect to the first one. So I have f, f plus delta f, f minus delta f. And as you can see, the result of summing up these three monochromatic waves is to have a beating. The more colors I'm adding, the shorter this beating comes. So this is telling me that if I want to generate a very short pulse, I need to sum lots of coherent um, monochromatic waves with the phase uh, which are log. Because if the phases are different, so for example, if two of these frequencies are delayed with respect to the others, so there's a, a phase shift, uh, my pulse is destroyed. So I started with the black line and I end up with something like the red, if they are not properly phase log. So how can we uh, phase lock all these monochromatic waves? So I will first uh, talk about mode locking and I will uh, present ways of achieving mode locking. Okay, so as we have said, a laser is an optical oscillator, which consists of amplifying medium enclosed between two mirrors that form a cavity. And as you know, a laser allows uh, longitudinal, longitudinal modes, which are space in frequency uh, by the resonance condition, which is this one. This means that if my uh, amplifying medium has a broad bandwidth, which for example, depending on sapphire, I can uh, have many modes simultaneously in my cavity. So uh, in this figure here, you can see at 51 modes, random modes, in a titanium sapphire laser. But of course, this is in, in the temporal domain. This is a disaster because I have all these spikes and I don't want to have this. I want to have just one pulse. So um, the, the question is, how can I convince all this small to overlap coherently? Okay, so um, a first strategy is to think, okay, I could just have one of these spikes. So for example, the spike, the spike which is most intense of all of them. If I can filter this, I will have a very short uh, temporal pulse. And a way to uh, do that is to use a saturated bola server. So a saturable absorber is a medium that behaves as transparent when the high intensity is uh, very high, and, uh, and as an absorber when the laser intensity is very low. So this, if I'm coming back to my previous slide, this means that uh, this medium will behave only as transparent for this peak here, while it will absorb the rest of the radiation. And of course, when I insert this, um, I isolate one of the of those spikes, and then I further amplify it. So at the output, I get very short passes. Um, a second strategy to get mode locking, which I think is the most widespread techniques, is the Kerr lens mode locking. Okay, so a Kerr medium is a medium with a third order nonlinearity. Uh, whose um, refractive index depends on the intensity. So meaning that if I have a Gaussian pulse, the refractive index will be higher for here than for the edge. And this is actually uh, the behavior of a lens, because if you think of a lens that I have something like this, 
in the, in the central part of the lens, the refractive index is, is higher. Well, not higher, but I have a, a longer path length. Okay. So uh, the care medium behaves uh, like a lens when the, for a high intensity laser, meaning that if the intensity is high enough, I will have something like a degree line, so it's out of focusing. While if the intensity is very low, I will have something like the red line, so it's not out of focusing. If I now place an aperture here, what I'm doing is I am filtering just the green line and blocking the red line. So typically, uh, the aperture is not needed because the optical gain increases for the pulse beam. So um, in practice, what I do is uh, only the highest intensity um, mode will be focused in a way that it will be overlapping with the pump, while the others will be larger than the pump and are not far enough to find. Okay, so the uh, model of technology is used for oscillators, and it allows to have a uh, megahertz repetition rate with a very short pulses, even 10 femtoseconds, but very low energy per pulse. So the limitation was actually the amplification crystal, because if I have a very high power, um, the crystal might be damaged. So uh, uh, Donald Stricker and Gerard Mulu invented in 19, 85, the technique that is called chirp amplification, chirp pass amplification technique. And basically the trick is that I broaden the pass on time, so I decrease the peak power. This way I can safely amplify in the crystal without damaging it, and then uh, I will recompress. So I will have first a device called a stretcher that will introduce a positive group velocity, uh, group velocity dispersion. And this will broaden my pulse in time. Then I will amplify this on the amplification crystal. And of course, I need to recompress back to the Fourier transfer limit. And this is done by a second device, which is called compressor, and basically introduces a negative dispersion. So uh, this technique was awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, three years ago. And here I have a picture with uh, Yeran Muru, who visited our lab shortly after being awarded the Nobel Prize. Uh, of course, um, the importance of the technique is not only the technique itself, but the many uh, fields that it were open thanks to the uh, terabat peak lasers with uh, short time durations. Okay, so uh, I want you now to show you an example of a laser that is used in a second lab so that we can uh, put in place uh, everything that I have talked up to now on a real system. So this is actually the, um, one of the lasers that we have in our labs. And uh, you can see here three boxes. So the first one contains uh, the oscillator and one of the pump laser. The second contains two amplification stage. The third one is the compressor and another pump laser. OK, so we start from the oscillator, and then we arrive here. And the first thing that we find here is a stretcher. So we are here. Um, in our case, the stretcher is a huge piece of glass. In other systems, this is um, like the one here in the picture, is uh, made with two gratings. Okay, afterwards, the pass is from the stretcher and seeded into a multi pass amplifier. So here we have the green light that you see is the uh, pump laser. Um, here, this one here the titanium sapphire crystal where the amplification takes place. And in this case, it's a multi-pass amplifier. So we are doing nine passes within the crystal. And at the output of this stage, we have two millijoule passes, but it's still long in time. Then we have a second uh, amplification stage, which is also a multi-pass amplifier. But in this case, we have only two passes within the crystal. And at the output, we have 10 millijoule passes, still uh, with a long term duration. So at the end, we need a um, compressor with, in this case, it's a couple of gratings um, to compress the passes. And at the output, we have something around 25 femtosecond passes. Then uh, this paper that you can see here uh, is an F22F interferometer. It's used to measure and then by means of a feedback loop to stabilize the carrier envelope phase because we are using this um, 
this laser in a nanosecond uh, laboratory experiment. Okay, so uh, this example was an example of a titanium sapphire laser, uh, which is one of the most common commercially available um, sources. The other source that is quite common is the interbion laser. Uh, titanium sapphire lasers usually have pulse per energy of one to 10 milliuse. It can be even boosted even farther by using uh, many amplification stage. Pass with uh, typically between 30 and 100 femtosecond, it can get even down to 20 femtosecond. And then the interview laser, it also emits in the, infra, in the near infrared, uh, pass width between 150 and 300 femtosecond. So as you can see with both commercial systems, we get a fixed wavelength in the near IR and limited pass widths. So the next question is, um, we saw at the very beginning that for many of the experiments that we want to do in nanosecond science, this is not enough. I need shorter pulses or I need other wavelengths. Um, so, for example, this is something I forgot to say before. Uh, particularly interesting are the sources in the mid IR because uh, this allows you to extend the cutoff of the harmonics and then you can access the suffix ray. But as you can see, this is uh, challenging to achieve with uh, commercial laser sources. So we need nonlinear optics. And now this is the second part of my talk. I will uh, uh, illustrate uh, mainly optical parametric amplifier and whole group fiber. So I will not use any equations during this talk. Just let me start for a very well-known equation for all of us, which is the Maxwell equation. And as you can see here, it appears the polarization, which acts as a source term for the electric field. Okay, so when I'm dealing with very weak fields, um, we can write the polarization as proportional to the electric field. And this is the uh, linear propagation regime. This means that if I have two monochromatic waves at frequencies omega one and omega two, and I'm propagating into a medium, at the output, I will have the same frequencies, omega-1 and omega-2. What happens now if I am increasing the intensity of my field? In that case, um, higher order terms of the polarization, which depends on the square, on the third power of the electric field, start to play a role. So for example, let's think only of the second uh, nonlinearity. In such a case, I have, of course, the first order, uh, the first order, the linear propagation, so omega one and omega two, but we see that different frequencies start to appear. So I have the sum frequency between the two monochromatic waves, the second harmonic of the first, the second harmonic of the second, and the different frequency between the first and the second. Uh, examples of uh, processes that depend on the second order nonlinear polarization are the second harmonics and frequency generation and the optical parametric amplification. Whether um, phenomena that depends on the third order susceptibility is the self focusing and the surface modulation, which are at the basis of the local fiber. Okay, um, let me start with EOPA. And for this, we will start from the different frequency generation. So uh, DFE is simply, I enter with two frequencies, omega-3 and omega-1 into a key two medium. And at the output, I get the uh, difference of both. If I want to understand this on a level diagram, I can see this as an, the absorbance of a uh, omega-3 photon, which is re-needed in uh, omega-1 and omega-2. So optical parametric amplification is basically the same process as different frequency generation, but the first in the initial conditions. So in the first case, the photon fluxes as omega one and omega three are comparable, while in the OPA, omega one is much weaker than omega three. So in the OPA terminology, we call it omega three pump, and omega one is called signal or seed. And remember this diagram here. So it means that I'm coming with a photon of omega one, omega signal, and an omega of omega three, omega pump. And at the output, I will have 
two photons of omega-1 plus the Eichler. The Eichler is the different frequencies between the pump and the signal. So at the end of the day, I have amplified my, my signal. And as any other second order nonlinear process, OPA requires the energy conservation and the momentum conservation. So uh, to evaluate the momentum conservation, I can write the phase mismatch, which is this quantity here. And then to satisfy this law here, I need this phase mismatch to be equal to zero. But up to now, I uh, have talked only about monochromatic waves but we are not interested in monochromatic waves. We want to deal with ultra short pulses. So um, let's consider my uh, pump as a monochromatic wave. My bus signal, the one, the one that I want to amplify, will not be monochromatic. So it will have a large bandwidth. It will contain many other frequencies, meaning that I need to satisfy this condition, phase matching equal to zero for all of these wave vectors. Okay. So to evaluate uh, which is the condition on the phase mismatch, I can do the following. So let's evaluate this expression by detuning the signal by delta omega. So I need to derive all of these terms with respect to the frequency. Remember but that the wave vector for the pump, we have said that the pump is monochromatic, so this term will be equal to zero. And then I end up with the derivative of the wave vector for the signal and the Eichler. And at the end, I get this expression because um, the derivative of the k vector with respect to the uh, frequency was the inverse of the group velocity. So basically, if I want to have the perfect phase match, I need to have this equal to zero. So let's see how can I achieve this to be zero. And I can use two geometries. So the first one is called the collinear geometry. And it means that the Eichler and the signal will travel parallel to each other, so they will be collinear. Um, to satisfy in that case um, the phase mismatch equal to zero, meaning it means that a group velocity of the signal and the Eichler needs to be the same. And moreover, I need to satisfy the condition and the energy conservation. So this means that also the omega of the Eichler and omega of the signal must be the same and equal to half the frequency of the pump. But I can also uh, form a small angle between the wave vector of the signal and the wave vector of the Eichler. And in this case, uh, this allows me to have the two passes to stay um, temporarily overlap for a longer time. So uh, the condition on the phase mismatch in this case is written as the group velocity of the signal must be equal to the projection of the group velocity of the Eichler. So we end up with this equation here. Um, so OPAs are useful to tune the wavelength range. So one thing that you may be interested in knowing is how much can I tune the frequency range with an OPA? So for this, we have to take into account two criteria. So the first one is energy conservation. And energy conservation is telling me the signal and Eichler need to be symmetric with respect to half of the frequency of the pump. The second criteria, of course, is the transmission range of the nonlinear crystal, because when the nonlinear crystal is absorbing, I cannot amplify anymore. Um, by the way, if, if you are interested in the uh, topic of OPAs, I recommend you this um, very nice tutorial paper. And also this one. So these two for me are very clear reviews on the OPAs. Okay, so let's see a practical example. Let's take one of the most common linear crystal, which is the BBO. Uh, BBO absorbs above three microns and below 250 nanometers. And uh, let's see what I can get with uh, two commercial lasers. So with the tannium sapphire and with the air filter. So for example, if I take my titanium sapphire laser and I use as a pump the second harmonic of the, of the titanium sapphire, I can tune my wavelength range for 470 nanometers roughly up to three micro. Remember that at three micro, this is the absorption of the nonlinear crystal. 
Uh, one important thing, if you want to build an OPA, for example, indivisible, uh, remember that your path wavelength needs to be always shorter than the, the wavelength that you want to define. Uh, if instead of the second harmonic of the titanium sapphire, I'm using the fundamental light, I can get something that is tunable between uh, above one micron and three micron. And if I'm using an interbeam laser instead of the titanium sapphire, I get something that can be tuned between 400 nanometers up to three microns. And here I show you yes, a few examples of uh, spectrum measure with different OPAs that we have in our labs and which is the temporal duration that we can get. So for example, the green line is a visible uh, non-collinear optical amplifier. We get uh, pulses as short as uh, 5.7 femtoseconds. Uh, going to the mid IR, we can get pulses at around 1.5 microns. Then Daniele Vida will um, talk later about how to even extend more up to the mid IR regime. Uh, in this case, you see that the pulse is uh, 8.5 femtosecond. Remember that here we are in the mid IR, so the, this is very close to the optical cycle. If you want to go to the uh, UV range, you cannot do that directly by an OPA. And uh, this is simply because uh, remember that I said before that you need a shortened pump wavelength than the wavelength that you want to amplify. So if I want to amplify, for example, light at 270, it means that I need to go below 200 nanometers, but this is uh, uh, where the BBO crystal is absorbing. So uh, in order to generate UV passes from optical parametric amplifier, what we do is uh, we can do some frequency. And then, uh, for example, this is a some frequency between a visible NOPA and a narrow band infrared beam. Or we can do the second harmonic, and then we get uh, deeper into the UV between 260 and 300 nanometers. So let me now show you. Uh, the practical considerations if you want to set up an OPA for your labs and how they are, how you can design them. So, for example, this is the uh, scheme of a visible non-collinear optical amplifier. As I said before, uh, in order to set up this kind of um, visible OPAs, we have to pump with a second harmonic of the laser, so at 400 nanometers. Okay, so the first stage, you need to have a very broadband seat that you will later amplify. So typically we do this by a super continuum generation on a glass plate. So for example, in a fire plate. And at the output, we get very broad band spectrum, but with um, very low energy, so something in the nano U range. Uh, then uh, we have to focus the seed and the pump into the BBO crystal. This is uh, where the OPA is taking place. So this is an open-linear geometry. Uh, between the pump and the pump, we have an angle of uh, 3.8 degrees. Um, the reason for this angle, this is called a uh, perfect uh, magic angle because it allows um, to amplify a wide range of spectral frequencies. So at the output, I get very broad band spectrum. So what you see here in the video, uh, this point here is the pump, so the 400 nanometers. This here is the seat. And what I'm here doing here, I'm changing the delay between the pump and the seat. So when they are not overlapping time, is now, for example, you see that this is very weak now. When I am uh, overlapping the on time, I am amplifying. So I see that this is getting weaker because I have the depletion of the pump because after I'm using the pump to amplify the seed. So we see that the, the seed is getting brighter, but we also see this line here. So this line here is the second harmonic of the idler. The idler in this case, remember that it was symmetric to half of the frequency of the pump, uh, lays in the infrared. Uh, why do we see all these colors? So we see it's a harmonic, that's why we see the colors in the visible, and they are angularly dispersed because we are simultaneously satisfying the phase matching conditions for lots of wave vectors of the, um, of the signal. Finally, the amplify beam, 
is not compressed, and we have to compress that. So you can use um, prism compressors, but they are not uh, very useful because you cannot control the third order dispersion. And then it's much more comfortable to use uh, the chirp mirrors compressor. So for those of you who have not worked with chirp mirrors, um, chirp mirrors are just mirrors which, which are designed in such a way that the blue color is penetrating less than the red one. So the red one is rather longer, and this means that we have a negative dispersion. So I am coming up after the white light and the OPA with positive dispersion because it's propagated by medium. And then I use this one to uh, impose a negative dispersion and compress the mass. And at the output, I get uh, a broadband spectrum that is ranging from 500 to 750 nanometers. Okay, let me now show you an example of an OPA that is uh, working in the infrared. So the, um, the idea is um, very similar to the visible OPA, but there are a few differences. So uh, the first difference is that we use a thicker sapphire plate. And this is only to extend the white light up to two microns. So I will have also the, the light in the visible as in the previous case. Um, I'm just using a different filter to cut off the 800. So in the first case, I was using a low bandpass filter. In the, this case, I'm using a high bandpass filter. So um, I will uh, let uh, the light from 850 to 2 microns passing by. And this is what I'm going to amplify. Uh, the second difference is that I'm not using the second harmonic for the pump, I'm using the fundamental for the pump. And this way I get amplification at 1.6 microns. Okay, so this is a practical example of an OPA source that is used for autosecond experiments. Uh, as I said before, the interest of having uh, OPA sources in the mid IR is because this allows me to extend the cut of the harmonics and then I can uh, reach the suffix region. Um, the example that you're seeing here is uh, an OPA developed in Katerina Botes laboratory. And there are a few differences with respect to the designs that I showed you before. So the, the first difference that we notice is that here, uh, we are not using a glass plate to generate the white light. We are using a filament or a holoco fiber. And the reason is that uh, with this approach, it allows for higher input energies. So remember that the damage threshold of a glass plate is much lower than the, uh, that it is in gases. So if I use the gas as a nonlinear medium, it allows for higher input energies. Okay, then we compress the pass. Uh, but as you see, the bandwidth of the output of the filament is from 600 nanometer to uh, 950 nanometers. So it's not going to the, to the infrared. And you see here that at the output of the spectrum, my light is uh, centered at 1.5 micron. So uh, this is uh, obtained here in a, a different frequency process within the uh, spectral uh, parts of the, of the pulse itself. So I'm taking the, the higher frequencies and the lower frequencies inside the pulses. And then I do the different frequencies. And this allows me to have the blue spectrum that you see here. Okay. And this is the spectrum that I want to amplify. So I amplify this by using two different um, optical parametric stage. And at the output, I get a milliju level 17 femtosecond pulses. Um, one advantage of using OPAs for driving uh, high harmonic generation is that the carrier metal phase is passively stabilized. So you don't need your laser to have to be CP stabilized because uh, you are um, intrinsically stabilizing the phase by using the OPA. Okay, so up to now we have talked about second order nonlinear processes. But now uh, we want to study third order nonlinear processes because this will be the basis of the holoco fibers. Uh, so let me recall the expression for the uh, phase in the temporal domain. And uh, we can write it like this. So I can see the carrier frequency as the derivative of the phase with respect to time. Okay, so what happens in a care medium 
is that the refractive index is not only the linear refractive index, but they have a second term, a second term which depends on the intensity of the pass beam. So at the output of the care medium, I will have my input pass, which has a quieter phase. And now, by simply inserting the expression of the refractive index in a care medium into the uh, spectral phase, the expression of the spectral phase, I get this expression here. So now I can do the same. I said, okay, the frequency will be the derivative of the phase. So let's calculate that. So if I calculate this, I get the central frequency, the carrier frequency that I have at the, at the input of the, of the curve medium, but I also have new frequencies that are given by this term. So this is called cell phase modulation, and it's responsible for a, a, the broadening of the spectrum on a curve medium. Uh, of course, up to now, things were a little bit simplified because we were assuming that the intensity depended also only on time. But this is not a real case. So the intensity depends on the, also on the spatial coordinate. And usually the uh, lesions beams do not have a uniform spatial profile. This means that I will have, uh, for example, hot spots within my, within my beam. And this will be translated into the, into the phase because it depends on the intensity. Uh, so it will give rise to a small scale in instabilities. And this will translate into the spectral broadening. So this means that if I just simply take my beam, put it into a care medium, I will not have a uniform broadening of the spectrum uh, for the whole uh, spatial beam profile. So to solve this problem, I need a guiding medium of large transfer dimension uh, which uh, guided just one single transfer mode. And the solution for this is a fiber. But still, if the fiber is empty, um, I'm not winning anything because I need a nonlinear medium inside uh, for the spectral broadening. So which is the medium that we can think of? So we need something that has a very high damage threshold because I remember that I'm interested in um, broadening the paths of very high peak intensity lasers uh, and a medium with fast and high key three. So the solution for us is a noble gas. And by combining a fiber with a noble gas, this is the holoco fiber technique, which was first proposed by Mauro Nisoli and co workers in 1996. So the, the use of a fiber uh, ensures that the guided propagation through grazing incident reflections at the electric inner surface. Then the losses caused by multiple reflections inside the fiber discriminate against a higher order mode. So we ensure that only one mode is propagated inside the fiber. And then by using a novel gas, we have a purely electronic third order chi 3 and we can easily control the nonlinearity strength because I can play with the length of the fiber, the gas type, and the pressure inside the fiber. Uh, of course, at the output of the fiber, my pass is not compressed, so I need a pass compressure. Uh, typically, we use two mirrors, so as the ones that you see in the picture here. So, for example, typical values that we get in our laboratories, starting from a six millijoule uh, 30 femtosecond laser, we uh, get 2.5 millijoule for femtosecond passes. So, practical considerations that you might need to take into account if you want to implement a hollow core fiber post compression. The first thing is that when you are dealing with very high uh, peak intensity, so for example, uh, with this example of six millijoule here, um, you might need to use a pressure gradient that is uh, have the vacuum of the input surface and a high pressure on the output surface. This avoids the uh, generation of plasma in the input phase of the fiber. Uh, another practical consideration, uh, you typically need a beam point and a stabilization system because uh, you need to enter always with the right direction into the fiber. Okay. So this brings me to the end of my talk. And just to conclude, I want to give you a brief overview of which are the current research topic nowadays on the field of ultrafast laser sources. Okay, so um, aside 
told you now, uh, in the fiber post compression, we are limited to typical durations of four femtosecond passes. So why cannot go, we cannot go uh, to even lower uh, short temporal durations? Well, the reason is that the, the output of the optical fiber has a very broad spectrum. So here you see that it can range from 300 nanometers up to uh, one micron, but we are limited by the pulse compressor because, for example, the chip mirrors, uh, it's very difficult to design them with a very large bandwidth. Actually, they cannot support a bandwidth that is going to, from 270 to one micron. They, they do not exist. So basically, they are keeping part of the bandwidth. So one solution to overcome this uh, problem, it was proposed by the group of Ferenc Krauss on a paper on science in 2011, is um, to divide the output of my fiber in different channels, and then to control the dispersion of each channel with a different set of shear mirrors that is specially designed for that channel. So for example, here they divided uh, the output of the fiber into the um, uh, this UV, so from 330 to 500 nanometers, uh, the visible channel 500 to 700, and a channel in the AR, so 700 to 1 micron. And as you can see, each of these channels has already a very short time duration because they have properly designed um, a proper shear pulse uh, compressor for, for it. So uh, the trick is now combining these three different channels into a single pulse. So for that, you need to be uh, to manage very carefully the dispersion of uh, of the three beams, and this is achieved by a fine tuning delay with uh, with a, a set of wedges. Uh, you also need uh, to have an active thermal and path length stabilization, meaning that your your breadboard needs to be small and need to be stabilize against the vibration and the thermal changes because it, this is very critical to combine all the, all the three channels. So by properly combining the three channels, you can have on-demand waveforms. So you can lay one pass with respect to the other and, and have a customized waveform. Um, this is an example. And as you can see here, for, this is the intensity, this is the electric field. Um, the, the peak of intensity has a very short duration, which is even sub femtosecond. So for example, if I have to run an experiment, which depends on the intensity, and, uh, and I can manage this with this part of the pulse, then I can achieve sub femtosecond resolution with this kind of approach. Very recently at uh, this in Hamburg, uh, Julio Rossi and uh, his co-workers and the uh, Franz Kevin group uh, presented the, a similar approach based on uh, OPAs. So in this case, they were using um, two different uh, OPAs, one in the near infrared, one in the mid infrared, and they were properly combining them to get very short pulses. So um, by properly combining them, they had that a spectrum that was ranging from uh, three, no, 2.5 micron up to 900 nanometers, I think. So in this range here, which is quite huge. Meaning that in the temporal domain, that gets something like 3.5 into second, and this is below the optical cycle um, at these uh, ranges. So uh, by doing this, uh, they were able to demonstrate that they can generate single at the second pulses directly from the output of the synthesizer. Okay, um, a second approach I want to comment on, and this will serve as an introduction to uh, one of the talks today, is the solid dynamics in hollow fibers. So as I said, we are in the hollow fiber, we are mainly limited by the dispersion, the dispersive mirrors that we have to use to compress the pulse. And therefore we have something that is typical around four feet a second. So uh, an idea could be, uh, what if I can uh, control for the dispersion inside a fiber? And this is a, a soliton. So a soliton is a balance between the nonlinearity and the dispersion. And it's such a way that you create um, a pulse that is not dispersed in time. 
but this is quite challenging to be done. It was achieved by the group of young travelers um, two years ago in a paper presented in Nature Photonics. So he will give you the details of this talk today at 11.30, the missed talk. But um, in practice, uh, they uh, managed to do that by uh, finding a balance between the input pass duration, using longer fibers than we typically use, and use at higher pressure. So by properly adjusting these parameters, you can have a solid on inside the fiber, which is self-compressed, meaning that you can get a huge multi-tape super continuous spectrum that is compatible with uh, one femtosecond passes. Okay, so with this, I thank you for your attention and this brings me to the end of my talk. I would like just to take the occasion to announce two books of position that are open in our group. So the first one is within an ERC Synergy grant uh, by Mauro Nisoli. This is in collaboration with uh, Fernando Martín at the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and Asterio Martín at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And uh, the topic of this research will be to investigate at the second electron dynamics in organic molecules, which are of particular interest for the optoelectronic systems. The second postdoc position is within the ERC starting grant by my colleague Matteo Lucchini. And it is with the investigation of photosecond dynamics in advanced materials, for example, to be materials. So if you are interested in any of this position, please, please feel free to contact me, Mauro or Matteo, and you can find also all the information on our website. So with this, I finish my talk. I thank you for your attention and I am now open for questions.